This is the second lecture on the second day of UNAVCO's short course on GNSS data processing and analysis with Gamut Globe K and TRAC. My name is Mike Floyd and I'll be presenting this lecture on generating time series with GLRED. SHGLRED is um, the main sort of script that we have provided for users uh, to run the Globe K part of things. And GLRED, uh, the program itself that SHGLRED, the script, runs, is just a way of invoking Globe K to process sort of one day at a time, or one session at a time. And SHGLRED is a script that invokes GLRED or Globe K easily for any sequence of days or combination of days. Once you've run uh, SH gamut for that number of days, um, you'll have a number of uh, these loosely constrained ASCII plain text H files that contain the parameter uh, uh, a priori estimates, the estimated adjustments and the covariance matrix associated with that solution. If you've um, uh, constructed your command files previously, SH Gamut had a series of command files that uh, were useful to have. SHGL Red runs in much the same way. The command files that you need to have um, constructed properly for the script to run automatically is the globe k command file, uh, globe k.cmd, and the glorg command file. GL, uh, glorg.cmd. Both of those we provide a template in GD tables so you can copy that template and make changes as you need to. Uh, generally we will put them in the experiment uh, GSON directory and then you can run SHGLRED to obtain time series uh, for example in the following way. You have SHGLRED with the experiment name, uh, a start time and a stop time. Uh, notice here that uh, this minus S option needs a start year and a start day and a stop year and a stop day. Uh, this is uh, different to SH Gamut where we would just have a year and then a start day and a stop day because SH Gamut expects to run or can only run within one year. Whereas SHGL Red can combine or create time series over many years. So it's just a subtle difference there in the minus S option of SHGL Red versus SH Gamut. Then you can specify uh, options uh, to SHGL Red which tell SHGL Red what to do. Uh, for example, here the uh, H option says translate those uh, gamut. Uh, plain text H files into globe K ready binary H files, then run globe K with the uh, capital G option using the globe K command and uh, optionally glorg command files, and then run uh, sh plot pos uh, by adding the uh, capital T option uh, that will create visual time series from uh, the globe K run. And uh, the lectures uh, are on Globe K and reference frames during this short course uh, will provide a little more detail into the construction of the uh, Globe K and the GLORG command files. Uh, and as we said, the, um, the, the templates in GG tables uh, also have a lot of comments in there telling you exactly what the commands are doing. There are the uh, Globe K and GLORG help files as well that explain a bit more of that and the manuals online as well. So you can look into more details there. Uh, sometimes we prefer or often we prefer to actually execute the commands for Globe K in a manual sequence. Uh, this gives us a little bit more control and confidence over exactly what's going on. Uh, SH Gamut uh, runs a pretty standard set of sequences. Whereas Globe K, as we've mentioned in, uh, in previous lectures on day one, uh, it involves a little bit more decision making depending on what output you want uh, for your uh, geophysical or, or other type of processing. But in general, uh, the way that this would work is uh, we run H to GLB, uh, which is equivalent to having the uh, minus opt H 
option uh, in SHGL Red. And again, that converts these plain text H files coming out from Gamut to binary H files that are expected for input to Globe K. This could also be used for other uh, types of input, such as SINEX files that you may have received from uh, other people. Uh, SINEX would be software independent exchange uh, or solution independent exchange, uh, which means that uh, the, uh, the, the, the file that we read into Globe K doesn't have to have come from Gamut, as long as it's got the appropriate information within it. We usually do this conversion uh, in the GLBF uh, directory, uh, which is standard. You can choose whatever you want, but uh, that's the way that, that we uh, conventionally um, do this process. Then we would actually run the solution in a GSOM uh, directory. Again, you can run the solution wherever you like. Uh, you can call the directory whatever you like, but this is our standard way of doing things. So in the JSON directory, we would actually create a list of these uh, binary H files that we just created, and uh, as well as any others that you might want to include. And this is the uh, list of, um, of quasi-observations, we call them, the H files that you are going to carry forwards into Globe K to make time series and velocities and other things. It's very useful uh, to um, run glist uh, before you actually run Globe K or SHGL Red uh, to uh, do a preliminary analysis, very quick summary of the H files that you plan to process. And it will output some associated information that can show you uh, if you are uh, about to run into problems. For example, if the a priori files that you wish to use in Globe K have inconsistent information with the information that's in the H files. Uh, the G, G list can do this very quickly uh, and it means that you don't waste time uh, running Globe K. So it's always very useful to run G list and just get uh, an idea of, of, uh, of any um, summary information and any potential errors that you might run into. Then GL Red, uh, which would be uh, comparable to running SHGL Red with the minus opt G option creates these uh, output files of Globe K, the .org file, uh, with individual solutions for each particular session, uh, usually just one per day. Uh, and, uh, and this will be the basis, these, these org files or, or one org file, if you choose to concatenate all the solutions into one large file, uh, these will pro uh, have the information in them to produce time series we can plot those time series uh, using the script shplotpos. Uh, this will first create uh, specific time series files from the org file. These specific time series files uh, have the extension .pos, so we call them .pos files. And uh, this would be running this command shplotpos would be equivalent to running uh, shgl red with the minus opt t option and this will produce plots so long as you have uh, GMT installed and accessible to Gamut and Globe K. And the final thing that we might do, uh, which we'll cover in uh, the third lecture of day two, is run Globe K to create a combined or velocity solution over a long period and, uh, and GLorg uh, to potentially um, run the solution in different reference frames, although we, we will come on to this uh, in more details. So I'll we'll just have a little look at some of these commands in, in, uh, in more detail now. Uh, H to GLB, again, that creates these binary H files for input to Globe K. All of the metadata in the plain text H file coming from Gamut is forwarded to the binary H files. So metadata would be things like the antenna information, the receiver information, the satellite information, uh, uh, the, the number of, of observations, all of these uh, different things are actually in the solution file and are carried forwards into the binary H file for input into Globe K. As I said before, H to GLB is not restricted to the H files coming from Gamut. You can also use uh, Sinex files, uh, Gypsy's Stakehold files, uh, or at least Gypsy versions previous to Gypsy X, which is the current version. 
Um, they can all be read by H to GLB and converted to a binary H file for use in Globe K as well. So this is useful if you are taking people's uh, solutions that have been processed in another software package uh, and uh, they, they can, you can still use that with, with Globe K. The only thing to be aware of is uh, the constraints that are implicit in those solutions coming from other software. Um, this is particularly important with Sinex files. Uh, constraints may be applied but not reported. Uh, and uh, it's very important to make sure that the solution that comes into Globe K is not overly constrained relative to what you're asking Globe K to do. Uh, for example, if you want to allow the solution to uh, be loosely constrained to estimate uh, site positions without interference from the constraints, uh, then you just need to be aware of how you convert Sinex files to the binary H files. And H to GLB has information about this in its help file. So a basic command uh, might be something like this, uh, H to GLB. Uh, the next uh, argument is the directory where you wish to put the binary H files. So if we are working in the GLBF directory, we could just put the files in the current directory, which is a, represented by a dot. The next argument is where you would like a priori orbit information to uh, be written. And generally speaking, we don't use this. Uh, and so you can just use a pair of single quotes uh, to basically form a null argument and you know just not write out the orbital information. You could also use slash dev slash null here to send that orbital information to uh, the null space on the computer. And then the final argument is the uh, or the uh, the by uh, sorry the uh, plain text H files coming from gamut that you wish to uh, the convert to binary H files. So again, if we are running this from a GLBF, we would need to go up one directory and then look in the day directories. This would be uh, a, a directory where there's three characters, the first of which is zero to three. Uh, second and third of which are 0 to 9. This covers everything from 0, 0, 001 to 365. And then within those directories, anything that begins with an H and then uh, an A dot, uh, this uh, identifies that it was the final iteration creating the H, uh, H file. Uh, something like this would get all H files, uh, H star, A dot star. Uh, so then we would list um, the binary H files that we want to use in our solution. Generally speaking, uh, we prefer the GLX solutions. So if you remember from previous webinars, uh, this is a, a global loose solution with fixed integer ambiguities, or at least as much as possible. Uh, the only exception to this is uh, we do not think that this is a good idea for GLONASS processing uh, because the ambi ambiguity resolution is uh, poorly constrained and potentially slightly incorrect. So for GLONASS processing, we prefer the GLR extension of the binary H file. So just uh, be careful uh, when you're creating your experiment list of H files to include in Globe K that you are using the GLX files for all other constellations apart from GLONASS. For GLONASS, we generally recommend using the GLR uh, suffix. We can then run our pre-processing checks using uh, GLIST. Uh, an example GLIST command would be something like this. Uh, we have an input list of H files that we just created by listing these H files into one uh, text file. Uh, we can specify an output summary file that gives us uh, some basic information like how often each site occurs, uh, how uh, the, the time period over uh, which each site was observed, the longitude and latitude and the height and, and things like that. Uh, we could specify a direction in which to sort the output file. Uh, so here plus one would be in chronological order, minus one would be in reverse chronological order. Uh, this is not necessary uh, unless you want to be explicit. We can compare uh, 
we, sorry, we can use um, uh, an EQ file, which is a series of rename commands to take account of changes in uh, the sites due to earthquakes or antenna changes, things like this that might uh, alter the position from one uh, time to the next. Uh, so we can, we can see what the application of this file might, might uh, uh, do to the output. And then we have a sorted uh, global directory listing. That's what GDL file stands for here. So this would be uh, the equivalent to this file, except sorted in an order according to this uh, chronological um, indicator. It will also calculate if there's any overlapping H files in time. For example, if you are combining your local network with an H file created for global processing, for example, the MIT global H files, those two uh, H files have different sites in them, but they're processed over the, over the same time, uh, for instance, on the same day. And when we combine those uh, networks together in GL Red, we want the information to be uh, put together. We don't want it to be separate. Uh, we want all of the orbital and site information to be combined and sort of averaged in, in some ways uh, to produce one solution for that, for that day. Um, so this is quite important um, to get the timing right, uh, to run GLIST, We'll, we'll, uh, we'll figure out for you if there are any overlapping H files in time and uh, is quite important for uh, producing uh, a GDL file that includes multiple networks on the same day that you might then run with GL Red. You may get some error messages um, like uh, site ID clashes and it would be uh, very good to resolve those potential issues before proceeding with GL Red or GlobeK. So to create time series, we run GL Red, um, as we've said before, simply runs the main program uh, Globe K once per interval, for example, daily, uh, to combine the data over that interval into one solution, effectively one time series point for every invocation of, uh, of Globe K. The standard uh, 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 command line would look like this. You, uh, you, uh, the command is GL red. Uh, this is a historical option. Uh, always just write six for the first argument. Uh, that means to output things to the uh, monitor, the, the screen. Uh, then we have an output file, which uh, I generally call you know, the program name, underscore, and then the date that it was run. Um, it, 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 this is a free uh, file name. You can call it whatever you like. Personally, I tend to just say glred underscore and then the date 2015-08-11.prt. Uh, we do the same thing with a log file, which records uh, the um, standard output from glred. Uh, again, my, I prefer the naming convention of glred underscore so that these two files match. Uh, and then we have our input list of H files. And finally, we specify the globe K command file to use. One of the first things that we'll often do is assess the solution by looking at the lines that begin with pos statistics. So you can use grep for this, and that will show you uh, the uh, reference frame um, implementation statistics. Ideally, you want to see a good fit to the reference frame with low numbers of the uh, normalized RMS and the weighted RMS uh, for the sites that we used to define the reference frame. So that's quite a handy one uh, to think about, just grepping on POS statistics or POS S should do the trick uh, from the output file. Uh, in the uh, old example, many years ago, uh, which is the way that uh, the minus opt E option works with SHGL Red, we would use, uh, uh, we would create um, MB files, uh, which are, are uh, time series files with a, a program called NSUM, E-N-SUM, which is what E stands for. Um, and then we would plot those, uh, those uh, MB files with SH baseline uh, to create those, those postscript plots as usual. This wasn't a very efficient method, um, especially with many sites that had 
uh, changes uh, due to earthquakes and antennas and things like that. So we created uh, an updated format for time series and this is invoked with the uh, minus opt T option for SHGL red. This will now use a program called TS sum to create our new format of time series, the .pos files from the output of GL red, the, GL, GL, uh, the uh, .org file. And then we can use shplotpos to create the uh, postscript plots from those .pos files. And shplotpos will actually read the .org file directly. You don't have to run TS sum first and then shplotpos on the pos files, you can actually just run shplotpos on the org file directly and it will run tssum for you. So just to summarize that, uh, the old scheme was that we had a .org file coming out of uh, glred or globe k. We would run ensum to produce what we called val and sum files, the, the values of the time series and then some statistics. We would use multibase to convert the val files to MB files, and then we would plot the MB files using SH baseline. And all of that could be done uh, with uh, SH plot CRD, SH plot cord. The new scheme is that we start again with that .org file, but now we run TSSUM, the new program to create POS files potentially run TS fit as well, which actually does some fitting to the time series. For, exact, uh, for example, a linear fit, uh, uh, seasonal terms, annual and semi-annual sinusoids, uh, breaks, discontinuities like earthquakes and antenna changes. And that would produce a .res file, a residual to the model that you fit. And both those .pos and the .res files can be then plotted with shplotpos. And in fact, if you set up a tsfit command file and you, and you uh, input it to shplotpos with the minus t option, all of this sequence can be done with shplotpos. So it's a very similar uh, uh, equivalent scheme of things, but this is the old way of doing things that's probably about 10 years old now. And this is the way that we prefer to do things now. For stabilizing sites to, uh, to define your reference frame and, and use particular good sites to, do, to uh, uh, stabilize the network for your time series and eventually velocities as well, we provide you with a series of files that is based on the current IGS realization of the ITRF 2014 reference frame, which is the current ITRF ref, uh, uh, solution. So the default .apr file uh, to define the reference frame is ggtables igb14 underscore com .apr. That has an equivalent eq file, which contains the correct discontinuity information uh, when sites move due to earthquakes and antenna changes, things like that. So these files um, help each other define the coordinates of the site, and any changes in the coordinates of site, the sites due to discontinuities. So it's a good idea to use these both at the same time. The uh, list of sites in the date APR file uh, is put into another file called igb14com.stabsite. And this lists uh, all of the sites in the APR file with the stab site command. So this tells glorg to use those sites to stabilize the reference frame using the coordinates and discontinuities uh, defined in the first two files. The igb14 uh, underscore com.apr file is actually a combined a APR file using many publicly available coordinate sources, uh, all aligned to the current IGS realization of ITRF 2014. So as I said, the igb14 uh, underscore com.eq file is associated with the APR file uh, with defined discontinuities due to equipment changes and earthquakes, for example. And then you'll see the content of the stab site file um, 
is is in a or, or sorry the uh, we have another uh, stab site file called igb14 underscore hierarchy and this contains a hierarchy of sites according to the igs core network hierarchy so according to the igs ideally the sites listed first on these lines should be the 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 best most uh, uh, appropriate most accurate reference frame defining sites. This line here in your uh, glorg um, command file would mean that if DRAO is available in the solution in your H files, uh, then use it uh, and its coordinate in this uh, APR file to stabilize the reference frame. Otherwise, see if BREW, B-R-E-W, is available. Otherwise, use N-A-N-O, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. And the APR and the EQ and the stab site core, uh, files are all available still in previous realizations of the ITRF 2014, uh, for example, IGS 14, and other reference frames like ITRF 2008. Um, uh, they're, they're in the GG tables uh, directory still as well. So you can use those as well. So again, we inspect the consistency of the stabilization uh, statistics. Uh, and um, ideally, you will have thought about how you want to define your reference frame before running SH gamut so that you build a network that has enough of these good sites available to define the reference frame. We want as many well-defined IGS sites as possible for redundancy. Generally speaking, we probably need about five or six. Ideally, we want 10 to 12 of these well-defined IGS network uh, sites being processed along with our network sites. We would ideally recommend using some of those sites in the first column of that hierarchy.stab site file um, because they're supposed to be the best. But remember the more uh, sites, IGS sites that you include, the longer the processing time will be because the processing time in gamut will uh, rise proportionally to uh, sort of approximately the number of parameters cubed, um, or so the number of sites cubed. Uh, we can check those uh, statistics again with this uh, by grepping on the pos s on the org file, and this is the sort of output that it would give you. All of the lines beginning with pos statistics shows you how many sites were used to define the reference frame on that particular day. Uh, you can see the equivalent name of the H file on the right hand side here. And uh, this gives you some statistics of those 41, uh, sorry, 51 sites on the first day, the weighted RMS residual of the site position relative to the reference frame APR file position is uh, 2.15, 2.55, 6.19 millimeters in east, north and up. The normalized RMS uh, is uh, beneath one, which means that our uncertainties are large enough to explain any variation, any scatter in, um, in the, uh, the, the reference frame positions relative to the reference frame as defined in the APR file. If you find that these numbers are particularly large, uh, you might have some issues with an outlier uh, or something like that. Generally, GLORG takes care of that. Uh, kind of thing outliers pretty pretty well, but sometimes you need to do a little bit of extra work just to hunt down where some of these higher numbers are coming. But this is pretty typical of uh, a well-defined network stabilization. The POS files um, contain your time series solution uh, generated from the org file. It's quite a long format. Uh, which contains your solution in various different coordinate systems. So for example, geocentric uh, Cartesian coordinates uh, would be X, Y, Z relative to the geocenter, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the center of the earth. Uh, we have geodetic coordinates, which is uh, standard longitude, latitude and height relative to the ellipsoid. And uh, we also have local um, coordinate systems. So east, north up relative to a nominal uh, coordinate of the site location. Uh, in general, it's the last of these that people want to look at and, uh, 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 and create time series from, but these other uh, uh, coordinate systems are also useful um, for other exercises as well. 
This can be input, uh, the POS files can be input into our program TSFIT, and there's an interactive version of TSFIT for MATLAB called TSView, which will actually produce an interactive um, interface that you can click uh, and load time series that way. Uh, POS files can also be input to SHCATS and SHHector, which use third party um, uh, programs, uh, CATS and Hector, which we won't go into very much here, but they require installation of these third party uh, programs first. And they, they do a little bit of analysis in terms of uh, fitting the time series and trying to understand the noise content that affects the velocity uncertainties. Um, and you can do all of that from the POS files with TSFIT or SHCATS or SH Hector. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a later webinar. Once you've done uh, some fitting, you can output the residuals files to that model, uh, which removes the, the model parameters and leaves you with residual time series. And both the original .pos and the uh, uh, residual .res files can be plotted with shplotpos. Shplotpos uses GMT um, and has a lot of features, uh, so we won't go into too much detail, but you can look at the help page to see all of the details but it can read in uh, .org files uh, and it will run tssum automatically if you do that. It can, it can uh, read .pos files that were created beforehand uh, using tssum and it can also uh, read these residual .res files which were output from tsfip or shcats or shector. Uh, and the input file that you specify is with the minus f option. If you want to run TSFIT uh, uh, from shplotpos, you'll need to create a TSFIT command file and uh, use the minus T option to provide that command file. It will calculate um, and plot some basic statistics like the weighted root mean square and the normalized root mean square uh, residual of the time series that's plotted. Uh, and you can do other things like add vertical lines at significant epochs, such as where there's renames or earthquakes. Um, in this case, you can uh, use the minus B option to plot the renames. You can uh, use the minus E option to plot earthquakes that, is, that are defined with EQ def in uh, the, the EQ file. And you can just specify uh, explicit times with the minus L option that you want to add uh, yourself from the command line. You can also reduce the time span that is plotted by using the minus T1 and minus T2 options. So you don't have to plot the whole length of the POS file. You can just plot between two particular times. And as I say, many other options, you can look at the shplotpos uh, help page for more information. So here's um, a, a, an example of uh, some of the um, visual work that you may need to do on the time series. On the left is a time series with good repeatability. The weighted RMS is quite small, under a millimeter horizontally and about three millimeters vertically. The normalized RMS is well below one which means that the uh, uncertainties, the error bars on the time series points here uh, are suitable for the level of scatter between the points themselves. In fact, if anything, uh, the error bars are probably larger than we might expect from this level of scatter, but that's okay. On the right, we see a very clear outlier uh, on this day uh, day number eight of July. This is the month uh, on the bottom of the axis and then the day of the month next to the axis itself. So this is a, a point that we might want to exclude um, because it doesn't really fit the rest of the time series very well. However, having said that, as much as it's an outlier, it actually has very large error bars associated with it, which means that it would be given a very low weight anyway. And you can see that in the normalized RMS here. The normalized RMS is about one, which means that the uncertainty, the error bar on this point, is still actually mostly appropriate for the level of scatter we see in the rest of the time series. So you could exclude this point. You could uh, uh, remove it as an outlier. 
um, which we'll come on to at another lecture as well. Uh, but, it, but it's important to plot your time series and actually inspect them visually. Sometimes outliers are actually due to reference frame stability issues. And we can see a sort of example here um, in uh, two sites, P204 and P203, which are pretty close to each other in California. On the left, on day 10 of July, you can see that in the horizontal, there is an outlier that's a little bit south and a little bit west of the rest of the time series. And you might say, well, I think that's an outlier for this particular site. But when you look at other sites, there's a similar pattern, at least in the east component. This, uh, this um, uh, site shows the same outlier, westward outlier, uh, at a nearby site. So in this way, it actually is more likely that this outlier here is just simply due to a reference frame stability issue. Um, again, it's probably okay to include ultimately, um, but don't get too uh, panicked if you see repeated patterns of outliers. It's probably down to your um, reference frame stability, and that's where reading those POS statistics lines really helps you understand how consistent the uh, reference frame stability is from day to day across the whole network. If we do want to exclude outliers or certain segments of data, we can create rename commands uh, using uh, or in a file that will read into the globe k command file with the eq file option. So for example, uh, if we see outliers at uh, site PTRB uh, that is associated with a particular H file that we're reading in, we could rename PTRB to PTRB underscore XPS. This would normally be GPS or 2PS or 3PS. If we put an X in there, that has a special meaning, which means to exclude the site from globe K combinations and velocity solutions. And that would only be applied to this H file here. If we wanted to use a time span in instead of a particular H file, we could simply uh, give the start date and the end date and it would do effectively the same thing. We can also use XCL, which means that the, uh, uh, the site will be excluded not only from the globe K combination and velocity solution, but it will actually be excluded from the time series as well. I prefer to use XPS because I like to see the outliers in the time series and know that I have added a rename command. <coughs> so I say XPS will it, uh, not exclude the data from GL Red, so it's still visible in the time series, but will be excluded from Globe K when we eventually come to do the velocity solution. XCL will exclude the data from all runs, GL Red time series runs and Globe K uh, velocity runs. When we iterate our solution, uh, the first time we normally use a set of very well-defined sites, just a few, maybe 10, 12, 20, depending on how many you have in your process network. <clears throat> and once a high quality position and velocity estimate for previously unknown or new sites is available, we can use those in a new APR file and use those as well to stabilize um, the, the, a second iteration of your solution using all sites with better coordinates. This approach can be used with both time series and velocity solutions. The method that we show here is basically the same for short versus long time series. Uh, it's the same procedure. Uh, the only difference is the number and the type of H files that you input. So for a short term time series, you might use daily surveys uh, or, or combine them into one solution. For long-term time series and velocity combinations, you might use several uh, of these combined survey files or many daily continuous files, for example, over years. Just to recap on the TSFIT and TSVIEW, TSFIT is the command line tool for fitting time series, those POS files, and generating statistics. So it inputs POS files and optionally the EQ files to define discontinuities, earthquakes, <clears throat> and fits the linear rate a and a choice of common parameters. For example, periodic terms, seasonal terms, discontinuities and earthquakes, 
even post seismic decays like logarithms for uh, to account for the uh, deformation after large earthquakes. And it outputs statistics of the fit, uh, standard uh, position and velocity.apr files that you can then read back into gamut in a second run or globe k in a second run. We have extended uh, um, additions to the APR files that contain the periodic and logarithmic decay uh, terms, for example, as well. So you can use those in globe k. And we can output uh, the residuals to the fit as well so that we can plot those. These are uh, defined by uh, what you include in the TS fit command file. So again, look at the TS fit help and you'll be able to understand more about how to output these files. TS view is just basically the same thing, but it uses a MATLAB interface that allows interaction. And TS view, you'll need to download uh, Tom's GG MATLAB package. It's just a series of, of MATLAB.m files in order to use Mat the MATLAB interface. So to summarize, SHGL Red is the post-processing equivalent of SH Gamut. The .pos file format is now standard for globe K output for time series. The visual inspection of time series is very important before you move forwards to velocity solutions and combinations to identify outliers and other bad segments of data and make sure that all of your um, potential problems have been uh, understood and dealt with. SHPlotPos requires GMT to create postscript uh, uh, time series uh, uh, visual plots and TSView is a MATLAB interface. You can populate the EQ files with rename commands or use uh, the SIG NEU command to downweight, add white noise to uh, certain outliers to mitigate the impact of poor or in incompatible data points during the velocity estimation. Just be aware that some outliers might actually be network stabilization issues if you see the same outlier recurring again and again among sites that are in close geographic proximity, it might actually be a stabilization issue and you could go back and look again at the pos statistics lines in the org file just to check on that stabilization. And uh, batch tools are available for uh, uh, pro, um, uh, understanding doing statistics on uh, longer, denser, continuous time series where point to point inspection is not reasonable. So TSFIT and TSVIEW can sort of check for outliers using uh, maximum sigma or n sigma outlier criteria, uh, which can be included here. So that's the end of uh, our slideshow um, and, uh, and lecture.